So, um, uh, happy Friday, everybody. Um, my name is Hal Langenbach. I'm an engineer here at Agri Waste Technology. Um, we have been carbon market verification uh, verification bodies uh, for a decade or a little bit more. Um, but our main focus, because of our background um, in livestock waste management, um, our recent uh, push has been more in the digesters for swine and dairy projects projects. And so uh, I want to explain a little bit about what the um, uh, verification process looks like and why, why it exists, uh, really. So um, let's see. Get started here. So the key takeaways that I'm um, trying to uh, get across during this presentation, and I hope, hope it'll be uh, relatively short and painless, but <laughs> we'll see. Um, is to understand the reason um, projects are verified. So um, uh, in order to claim credits, you have to get a project, you have to go through the verification process. So uh, I want you to understand the general steps um, that are involved in um, verification, understand the different parties that are involved. And I have a few of the, the lessons learned um, that we've uh, experience throughout our 10 years or more of uh, work in this area. A little bit about uh, carbon terms. Uh, carbon's uh, kind of like any other um, area where it has its own language. Um, and so I wanted to kind of explain some of that because I think it'll uh, help make uh, some uh, slides further on down the road make a little bit more sense. So a common term is a project developer. And so uh, you'll be hearing from Patrick Wood here in a minute. Um, who it acts as a project developer, but a project developer is a person who assists in kind of getting projects off the ground, but also day-to-day um, -day kind of activities to ensure that projects get um, the credits that, um, you know, the projects are designed for. Then there's the registries, and the registries um, basically act as um, a platform to track, manage, and trade the credits. So there's three um, main ones here in North America, uh, the Climate Action Reserve, uh, American Carbon Registry, and Verified Carbon Standard. Um, there are others, there's Gold Standard and uh, a few others, um, but we don't work too much in those. Um, so, you know, these are the three that um, we, we typically work in. So you'll often hear um, a difference between uh, voluntary and compliance markets. Um, so the voluntary markets are really um, generating credits in order for usually large corporations, but it could just be, um, you know, individual people. It could be anybody who want to buy the credits with the idea that they're going to retire them to um, offset some of their um, emissions from their business activities. The compliance market is mainly um, part of California's um, cap and trade program. And so um, a lot of the projects have moved from voluntary, at least the digester projects have moved from voluntary to the compliance market. And then they've moved on to the low carbon fuel standard uh, market, too. So CARB is another term. Uh, that's the California Air Resources Board. They're basically in charge of the um, the California both offset markets and the LCFS program, which is the low carbon fuel standard. Additionality is a concept of that projects are only eligible when they um, generate credits for activities that wouldn't normally happen. If a law was passed that says you have to do a certain activity, then that makes the project ineligible to claim carbon credits. So if a law is passed that said you have to put in a digester, then for that that project, then there's not, you know, no carbon credits could be issued for that. So um, for uh, the registries also um, issue protocols um, and the protocols are basically just a, that's a standard a set of rules, a set of calculations on how the projects must be run, how much, how they're operated and um, uh, how the calculations must be performed. The uh, CO2 equivalent, I just wanted to, um, I think my mood touched on this and I um, probably did a better job on explaining it than me, but basically it's just that, that difference that, you know, methane can be 28 times of what um, CO2 is. So you basically put everything in the same units by 
converting, if you have methane emissions, you convert them back to carbon um, dioxide equivalents. So that's all that's about. Um, most carbon credits, by the way, are um, issued as uh, carbon dioxide equivalents. So um, that's uh, how, how everything's measured. Leakage is um, the idea that if your carbon project is causing increased emissions somewhere else, um, then that's going to uh, cause your project to become ineligible to or it potentially could. So if uh, you have emissions from your lagoon and you are getting rid of those emissions from your lagoon by pumping it to your neighbor's lagoon, and that's going to double their emissions, but you're not going to have any emissions anymore. You're not going to be able to claim credits because you're just, you know, moving the emissions down the road. So that that's not a eligible activity. Um, so the verification, that's what we do. Um, and so basically it's a, a systematic um, audit. It's not like a, you know, IRS audit, but it is a, an audit um, where we have to Look at you know a set of documentation calculations um, and actually go on site and look at the site um, in person to make sure that the project um, is following what the protocols um, requires or not the pro yeah what the project activities follow what the protocol re requires um, double counting is the idea that you can't claim the same activity in the same carbon credit on two different registries, or you can't, um, you know, buy and sell or retire that same credit multiple times. Um, the baseline scenario um, is an important part of all the calculations, but that is kind of what it looked like before you put the digester on, on the farm. So if you, um, you know, had freestall that flushed into a, um, storage pond, then that's kind of a description of your baseline scenario. It also includes solid separation equipment that might have been there um, or, you know, which barns went to, you know, the pit versus which um, had um, pack bedding, that kind of thing. So why verify project? Well, um, it's a requirement mainly because it's a financial instrument. It's, it, you know, the carbon credits are worth, um, and right now they're worth quite a bit of money. So um, in order to have some, um, some idea that the, the financial instruments are real, they, you know, all the registers require a verification of uh, the carbon credits. And it's also to ensure that uh, between two different projects, the projects are being evaluated fairly um, and in the same way. So you can't have one project down the road that's calculating um, their emissions one way and another one, you know, that's doing it a totally different way and they come up with different numbers. So it's a way to, to compare apples to apples. Um, it also strengthens the public's confidence in the program. If they know that um, an engineer is coming back behind um, another engineer or, uh, you know, a project developer or whoever, to check to make sure that the um, uh, calculations are done correctly, the documentation's in place, and the um, system is set up correctly, then you know it, it does give confidence uh, to the public that it is a, a real and um, a reliable program. So the players, you basically have the farmer producer. Um, they typically own the animals, um, the manure, the um, manure systems, the solid separators, that kind of thing. Um, and they usually typically get a percentage of the value of the credits or they get the credits at the end, uh, depending on how their contracts are set up. The project developer, I'll let Patrick get into that uh, more a little bit later, but uh, basically they, you know, work with um, their experts in how these systems work and how these projects um have to run and have to calculate the credits. And so um, they work with the farmer and the registry and the verification body to make sure that, uh, you know, the projects can uh, earn the credits that they deserve. The registry, um, we've mentioned them before, but they basically maintain the protocols. They also um, kind of break ties when there's an argument between um, uh, either the verification body and the uh, project developer or, you know, if there's a 
Um, if a, one of the rules in the protocol is not as clear as it could be, um, then uh, they will uh, help um, negotiate how, how that's handled. The verification body, again, is, you know, the, that's the kind of the auditing uh, board that basically signs off that uh, the credits um, have been uh, calculated and um, issued um, according to the protocol requirements. So this is kind of um, a, a schematic, and there's a lot of a lot of things going on here. Um, but the key key thing I think to focus on is the fund. You know, the funding is a very very important part, and the markets are a very important part. There's a lot of you know the terms that I mentioned earlier in terms of the verification body and the developer and the farms, but there's also outside parts that are important for um, you know, successful projects to succeed in terms of having the funding to put in the, the systems and having a market so you can sell the credits after you're done, done generating them. So the um, verification of a digester project, it's important that everybody work together. Um, if you have a party that is not um, not cooperating within the system, everything kind of comes to a halt. And so, you know, producers, um, project owners, project developer, developers, verifiers, and registry strap staff all have to work together in order to um, work through any of the problems that come up during verification. And um, it's important that, that everyone, you know, um, uh, be willing to work with each other. So um, most of the uh, communication and the work happens between the verif or for the verification process happens between the verifier and the um, project developer. So the farm, individual farmers will be involved in site audit. Um, they also um, provide some documentation and that kind of thing during the verification process. But most of the, fa the farm is usually communicating to the project developer and the project developer communicates to the verifier and or the registry. Um, so the verification, you know, this is a very um, kind of uh, thousand mile high view of, of what verification looks like, but um, we have to uh, perform a conflict of interest um, uh, evaluation um, and, and file that with the registry for most, most of the registries in a way. Some of them don't require that. Uh, we develop sampling plan. We do have an in-person site audit um, for each verification. There's a, a desk audit, which is basically a review of the calculations and documentation. Um, and then we, work, we issue a report and a statement um, that says uh, the, the credits are either positive, uh, positively verified, qualified, positive, um, or there's, there could be a negative um, verification statement if there are uh, enough nonconformances regarding the project. Um, verifiers have to be a third party. So um, verifiers, um, although we have a lot of experience in the area, we can't provide advice uh, to the project developer or the farmer and say, you know, we can't give advice like, well, if you put this solid separator in this location, you're going to get more credits. That That's a conflict of interest. Um, and so we're not allowed to provide that kind of advice. That's the project developer's job, not, not the verifiers. Um, I'm not going to uh, go through all these. I think you can read them, and I'm kind of running short on time. So um, I do have some underlined here, and the reason these are underlined um, is are the uh, this is where most of um, the errors and the more difficult work kind of falls. Um, a lot of the um, the the eligibility requirements and all that kind of stuff can be worked through fairly quickly. The calculations and quantification, some of the calculations can get uh, to be um, on the difficult side, but um, you know, certainly certainly doable doable by some uh, someone with a you know a science background. The monitoring and data systems, you know, they really have to be set up right. Um, and also, I didn't underline it, but the bit about the project boundary. Um, on the right side. That's a very, very important uh, concept. And uh, the next slide will, will show you a little bit about what I mean on that. 
So the project boundary, um, all of, each protocol has um, an evaluation of what the project boundary looks like. And this is a schematic um, we took out of the um, livestock protocol for the offset projects. But um, basically, you can see the, um, the outer line. So the enteric fer fermentation um, cow burps is SSR1 there at the top, and it's outside the boundary. So we're not considering those, but we are considering the emissions from let's say SSR4, uh, which is on the, the far left side of the schematic, which is waste treatment and storage. So it's your emissions from your lagoon or your, your storage pond. So this, this mainly comes into play for calculations and um, regulatory assessment of the, the um, whether the uh, farm and project is in regulatory compliance. So uh, lessons from existing projects. So, um, you know, the microbes that are in digesters, they require a, a pretty specific temperature range. And so in the northern climates where the dairy belt is and, um, you know, su supplemental heat is needed. So whether you get that heat from, you know, the waste heat from an engine or you have a boiler that's burning natural gas, you get, you're very likely going to have to add some supplemental heat. Uh, you also have, and this is, you know, where I'm, I'm coming back to, you know, everybody having to work together, but, um, you know, the disinfectants, if, if the farmers, um, you know, disinfecting the swine building and that's running into the digester, that could impact um, the population of the microbes in the digester and your gas production could uh, go down to almost nothing. Um, the reduction of the hydraulic, hydraulic retention time. Uh, so, if you have a covered lagoon, like shown in this picture, um, you could, you know, it could fill up with sludge and any new added manure, you know, it's just not going to have the room. Um, it's going to kind of get through the digester quicker than it needs to um, before it has a full, full time to break down and produce the gas. Um, there could be pressure problems. If, if you don't have a pressure release valve um, that, you know, uh, lift, Covers on these digesters have been lifted off sometimes, and uh, that could release gas or damage the digester itself. Um, on digester design, um, you know, if you put a flare right beside this um, HDPE covered uh, cell, you know, you can see where that could be a danger. Um, if you get a hole in the the uh, the cover there, and it's right next to a uh, to your flare, uh, you could you could definitely have a a problem there, and size for future expansion um you have to keep that in mind you know most dairies are are going to expand at some point it would make sense just to go ahead and design a digester so that it can handle some future expansion otherwise you're going to have to build a whole other digester cell if you're wanting to include the new animals um project problems um you it uh, looks like i'm wrapping up on time but um these are some of the the problems we've both associated regarding projects and you know most of them lead to uh issues with reduction in credits so um here are a few links that you should get a copy of this in the the notes uh, so you can check those out when you get a chance and if you have any future questions that's uh, my link thanks